Well, I want to welcome you to week two of Thy Kingdom Come. This is the second week in our series where we're looking at the kingdom, the kingdom of God, sometimes referred to by Matthew as the kingdom of heaven, and we'll talk about that at another time. But we're working our way over the next 10 weeks in, in this topic that was near and dear to the heart of Christ. He talked about it incessantly. And we kind of topped on that last week, and we're going to pick it up this week. And just the idea that Jesus said so much about the kingdom of God, I was blown away as I went back and I read through the Gospels, just how many times he referred to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom in general. As a matter of fact, we know this from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. It's how he began his ministry. We looked at this last week. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. One of the things we talked about last week was how Jesus constantly tied the kingdom and the gospel together. They weren't two separate things. They were one and the same thing. You couldn't have one without the other. And so here he is beginning his ministry according to the gospel of Mark. And he begins it by proclaiming the gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? It's that the time is fulfilled. The king has arrived and he is that king. He's the Messiah, the Messiah of Israel, who they had been waiting for for centuries. And he had come to bring the kingdom. And so that's the good news. That's what he came to proclaim. So Jesus began his ministry talking about the kingdom and he talked about it all the time. So in the gospel of Matthew alone, this is what jumped out at me. 48 times he mentions the kingdom. 48 times. But look at this. He only mentions the gospel four times. Now we, because we're on this side of the cross, we, we talk about the gospel a lot. And the gospel to us is always in relation to salvation by faith alone in Christ alone, which is true. But for Jesus, it was inseparably linked to the coming of the kingdom or the king. Notice this, he only mentions love eight times in Matthew's gospel, and he only mentions, for, mentions forgiveness one time. So those things that are near and dear to us, the gospel, love, forgiveness, which Jesus talked a lot about, he only mentions a few times as compared to the 48 times he mentions the kingdom. So the kingdom must have been important to him, and obviously it was and it should be to us. That's the whole reason we're doing this study. So the kingdom of God, what's interesting is it's not used in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, neither one are used in the Old Testament. All we have are two references, both in one in 1 Chronicles and the other one in 2 Chronicles, where something similar is mentioned. So in 1 Chronicles 28.5 it says, he has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So that's one of the references where we have something similar to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The second one is in 2 Chronicles. Now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David. These are not the same. They're not mentioning the same thing. But what they do is they set up the context or the idea of a kingdom, a kingdom that belongs to the Lord, God, Yahweh. Something that belongs to Him and something that is shared by Him with others. In this case, David and his sons. So where did the Jews get the idea from for, for the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? We've just seen two cases in First and Second Chronicles where it's the kingdom of the Lord. Where did they get this idea from? Well, the Psalms repeatedly talk about the king and his kingdom. And here's just a few examples. Psalm 99, 1 through 4 says, The Lord reigns, Yahweh reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Now catch this. The king in his might loves justice. This is talking about Yahweh. This is talking about God, that he is ultimately king. We also have in Isaiah 33, 22, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Again, speaking of Yahweh, this is talking about God being the king. 
But where did they get this concept about God as a king? Did they make it up? Was it because all the nations around them happened to have kings and so they treated God as a king? Where did they get this from? Well, again, we go to the Psalms. In Psalm 74, 12, it says this, You, O God, are my king from ages past. Now, I want you to notice how often he mentions the past, uh, the old days, so to speak. Bringing salvation to the earth, both day and night belong to you. You made the starlight and the sun. You set the boundaries of the earth. And you made both summer and winter. Now, this is speaking of the creative ability of God, that God is the creator king. And he says, you are my king because you are from ages past. You're eternal. You're transcendent. You have no beginning. You have no end. You created everything that we see, the universe, the plants, the animals, the sun, the stars, the moon. You created mankind. You are the great king. Why? Because he made and this takes us all the way back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 tells us how God created all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now we're going literally back to the beginning because for us to understand what Jesus said about the kingdom, we have to understand what he meant by the kingdom, what he meant about the king and who was the king, the king over Israel, the king over all things. And as we've just seen, it all begins at the beginning. Before there ever was a man, a woman, before there ever was a king, there was God the king. God was ruling. God was sovereign over all things. And it began in the beginning when he created all things. In the beginning, God created. I love this from Nick, Nicholas Perrin's book on the kingdom of God. He says, creation, scripture tells us, is God's handiwork, God's art. When God or Yahweh is first introduced in scripture, he's introduced as one who creates sovereignly. In other words, he does it with power, with authority. The act of creation is a completely autonomous act. There's nobody else involved. Now, we do know the Godhead is, head is involved. Uh, the book of Genesis goes on to tell us that each of the three members of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were involved. But there's no one else because there is no one else. There's no human being created yet. So God is operating independently, autonomous, autonomously, and sovereignly doing what he deems best and doing what he deems right. So he's the king, so to speak. It doesn't declare him the king at this point in Genesis chapter 1, but he is acting in the role of a king, sovereignly, autonomously, with no one else telling him what to do. Because repeatedly in Genesis chapter 1 we see this, and God said, God speaks, God says something, he speaks something, and something happens. He speaks, he says, let there be light, and there was light, we see in verse 3. He says, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and it was so. We see in verse 9, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and then let the dry land appear, and it was so. So he speaks, and things happen. Not just small things, not minuscule things, not unimportant things, but incredible things happen. God speaks and the amazing things happen. It goes on. He speaks, let the earth spout veg vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit with, with their seed. And it was so. It happened. He says it, it happens. He says, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. And it was so. Verses 20 and 24, let the water swarm with living creatures. And it was so. It happened just as he said. All of this is symbolic of his sovereign, kingly power. There's no one more powerful than God at this point. There's no one to stop him from doing what he wants to do, what he deems to be right. It says, he said it and it was so. He's, he's operating as a king. He's exercising sovereign authority. Now, what does that word mean, sovereign? 
It literally means the quality or state of being sovereign. You are the sovereign. You are in complete control. You have supreme power and you have supreme authority. Again, you got to remember that there's no one else at this time, no other created being except the angels who are up in heaven. And then there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God, by virtue of the Trinity, is creating all things that we now know. The universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, heaven, vegetation, animals, fish, birds, and then mankind. And He's doing it sovereignly and He's doing it independently. He has the right to do so. Why? Because He's God. Because He is completely independent, transcendent. He is not dependent upon anyone or anything. He can do whatever He wants. It's His prerogative. So even though Genesis doesn't describe God as king, it literally paints the picture of him being the sovereign king over all the universe, over everything that he has made. Nicholas Perrin goes on to say, the divine word is spoken and immediately it's fulfilled. There's no long delay. There's no wait. God speaks, let there be light, and it is done. In speaking creation into existence, God is acting like a king. God isn't just a king, but the king of the whole cosmos. So if you think about it, the, the Jews were steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. They, they studied it. They, they revered it. They, they read it constantly, and they understood that their God was king. That's why you read in the Psalms and in Isaiah that Yahweh is king. Why? Because He created everything. It all belonged to him. And it reminds me of an earthly king named Nebuchadnezzar, the king over Babylon. This guy was a pagan king. This, this guy was totally human. He wasn't divine, even though he probably thought he was. But listen to what he said about himself. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? What's happening here? Here's an earthly king, a man, only a man, who happens to be a sovereign, a king, all-powerful, and he believes that he's the one who's made Babylon, this incredible city, one of the wonders of the world. And so he is bragging about it. He is glorifying in all that he has made because he's a king, because he has power, because he has authority, because he is sovereign over all things. And yet, while the words were still in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, God says, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know, now catch this, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will. Who's ultimately king? God. Here's Nebuchadnezzar, king over Babylon, the, one of the greatest nations that ever existed on this planet. And at this point in time, he's one of the most powerful men on the planet. And yet God says, no, King, king Nebuchadnezzar, I'm the Most High. I'm the one who put you on the throne. And guess what? I'm the one who's going to take you off the throne. I'm going to demote you. You're going to live like literally a madman eating grass like a cow in a field until you come to an end of your pride because you are not king. I am king. See, this picture of God as king is so important for us to understand when we talk about the kingdom because what we have in our day and age, 21st century Western America, we have men still trying to be king. Men who still want to rule over the world, just like Nebuchadnezzar. And, and here is God telling Nebuchadnezzar, no, ultimately you don't rule. Ultimately, I'm king. I've never stopped being king. I've never stopped ruling over this world. And you are nothing but a man. So this idea of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man is something we see all throughout Scripture. And when Jesus shows up in the scene and he begins to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he's talking about something dramatically different than the kingdoms of men. He's talking about the kingdom of God, restoring the kingdom of God to this earth. 
Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Who's he talking about? He's talking about God. Guess what? He's not talking about you. He's not talking about me. He's not talking about Nebuchadnezzar. He's not talking about any president, dictator, any powerful figure in this world. He's talking about himself. And he doesn't say, my kingdom come. See, one of the problems we have, and it's the greatest problem we have, is this one. I want my kingdom to come. You want your kingdom to come. Every man and woman living on this earth wants their kingdom to come. They want a kingdom that they rule. They want to be in authority. They want to be in control. They want to be autonomous. They want to be sovereign. And it's something even we as believers fight that we want to be in control of our destiny. We want to be the master of our fate. And the risk we run is taking God off the throne so that we might reign on that throne. But guess what? God's not going to give up his throne. He wasn't going to give it up to Nebuchadnezzar. He's certainly not going to give it up to me. He's not going to give it up to you. So this idea of the kingdom is essential. And that's why Genesis is so important for us to understand what God did at the beginning. God was king and God was establishing his authority. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us, there's a picture of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image after our likenesses and let them have dominion. This is going to be essential for us to understand the kingdom. He says, let them, man, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So here's the Godhead, the Trinity, and they are making a decision to make man in our image and then to give man dominion. So it goes on and says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And God blessed them. He blessed Adam and Eve. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is a huge issue that we need to get our heads and our hearts around because God created man and woman and then he gave them authority. He gave them dominion. What does that mean? The, the Hebrew word is literally rada. And it has to do with these things, to rule, to have dominion, to have, to put things under their subjugation. In other words, to ha have power over all these things, over all created things, and to reign over those things. But, but in this context, as stewards, as vice regents, in other words, God's the king, he's made it all, and now he's handing over control of it to Adam and Eve and basically saying, I want you to subjugate these things. I want you to rule over these things. I want you to steward these things on my behalf. And you answer to me. See, this is so important for us to understand because this was part of the mandate given to Adam and Eve that has been passed down to the rest of their progeny, to you and I. We have been given dominion. God created us in his own image. So what does that mean? It's, it's literally to be in the image of God is to be a son of God, a child of God. We bear his image. We, we, we don't look like God in the sense that I look like my dad or you might look like one of your parents. That's not what this means, but we bear the image of the Godhead. And, and this idea that I bear the image of God means that I am a child of God. I am made by him and I'm made for him. I am made to serve him. We know this about Jesus. Jesus is the Im image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. That doesn't mean he was created, but in the sense that he's a son of God, we are sons and daughters of God. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. See, Jesus Christ took part in, in the creation of all that we can see, including you and I. He was part of the Godhead and he was part of the creative story and all things were created through him and for him, Paul tells us in Colossians. 
So this is a huge issue that we need to understand that we have been made in the image of God. And one of the best ways to understand that is to understand how kings used to spread their image. We know from Nicholas Perrin's book and other books that I've read on this whole issue of, of the image of God that it was traditional for kings to create images of themselves. We know from Near Eastern backgrounds that kings would regularly leave 2D or 3D images and or likenesses of themselves in territories and cities where they sought to establish their reign. So what a king would do is he would conquer an area and he would immediately put up statues of himself. Why? It was a symbol of his power, a symbol of his presence, so that those he was subjugating would understand that this is your new authority. We know that Nero did it, Caesar did it, uh, the pharaohs did it. They, they would put images of themselves either in 3D as statues or 2D as coins. Or they would put up placards of themselves to spread their image abroad. It was commonly done and it was the people were used to seeing this. You almost expected it to happen. So Nicholas Perrin goes on and says this, By creating Adam and Eve in the divine image, God intended to stake out legal territory establishing his jurisdiction through their image-bearing presence. Wherever humanity might be found, we must think of Adam as a kind of living, sacred projection of Yahweh. This is amazing to me. I've, I've never really thought about it this way. That when God made Adam and Eve, and then he said, be fruitful and multiply, he was basically said, saying, spread my image abroad. It was like him putting up statues of himself, but these were living representations of himself, images of himself in the sense that they were made by him, they represented him, and they were to carry on his dominion everywhere they went. That's why it was so important for them to obey the crea creation mandate, to be fruitful and multiply, and to spread abroad the image of God everywhere they went. See, here's what you have to understand, that when God commanded Adam and Eve, He commanded them to do certain things. And He was very specific. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Well, the animals were commanded to do basically the same thing, but with Adam and Eve, it had a different purpose behind it. They were to spread the image of God. See, when oxen had more oxen, they weren't spreading the image of God. When birds created more birds, they weren't spreading the image of God. But when Adam and Eve bore children, they were spreading the image of God. They were to fill the earth and subdue it. And that literally means they were to extend, to extend the divine presence everywhere. They were to begin in the garden, but they were to move beyond the garden and take the presence and the image and the divine presence everywhere they went. Remember, this is pre-fall. This is before sin has entered into the scene. And so they were to do this, and then they were to have dominion. They're the only created being who is given dominion, authority, power. Why? So that they might rule over creation as God's proxies. He didn't give it to any of the other animals. We sometimes refer to the lion as the king of the beast, but he's really not. The king of the beast was Adam. Adam's the one who named all the beasts, according to Genesis. And so here we see God commanding Adam and Eve to spread His image, to extend His divine presence, and to rule over creation as His vice regents, as His proxies. They answered to Him, but they were given power by Him. And I love what Genesis goes on and says, God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything, notice how many times he says, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And what does he say? It's good. No, it's very good. This is the first time in Genesis chapter 1 where he deems everything very good. Why? Because he has made man. Why? Because He has given them authority and dominion and He has completed His creation project and He has put man in charge of it. Adam and Eve, to be fruitful, to multiply, to bear His presence, to extend that presence all over the earth, everywhere they go, 
through their progeny, through their seed. And it was good. God says it's very good. I don't know what creation looked like in the beginning, but I have a feeling it was a beautiful place. I believe the garden was a, it was a gorgeous place and it was fruitful and it, and it was abundant in everything because God repeatedly said, and it is good, and it is good. And then he says, and it's very good. I love this from Sirgud Greenheim in his book. He says, where God rules as king, there are no evil powers. I often dream of such a society, a society without evil, a society ruled by God. I imagine what the world would be like if everyone did good all the time. If every individual always did what God wanted us to do. See, Sirgud dreams of that. You and I dream of that. We, we long for a time where there's no more sin, where no one mistreats another human being, where, where equity is real and alive and where we get along between the races. We long for that day, but guess what? There was a day when it did exist and it was in the garden before the fall. And so Adam and Eve lived in this perfect society where everyone got along and it was a beautiful place and it was God in control and God ruled as king and he gave his power and authority to them. And you would think, well, this is, this is great. This is good. This is, this is going to last forever. But we know how the story goes, right? It didn't last. Sirgud goes on and says, if all people always did the will of God, the world would be a happy place. If God would rule as king and everyone would do as he says, our planet would be a paradise. But is it? Do we live in Eden? I don't think so. You know, I got up this morning and, and got on social media and it didn't take long to realize I, I don't live in Eden. I don't live in a garden. I, I live in a place that is dark. I live in a place where people hate one another. I live in a place where there's sin. I live in a place where there's all kinds of hurt and harm taking place as men and women do incredibly evil things to one another. Why? Because of the fall. We're going to talk more about that next week, but we know from Genesis chapter 3 that things didn't stay the way God had created them. He said it is very good, and he had given his power and authority to this man and this woman, but they didn't really handle it well. And, and it reminds me of the fact that is God, in, <clears throat> excuse me, is God any less in control? Is he any less powerful today than he was back when he created the Garden of Eden? Back when he made Adam and Eve? No. He's just as powerful. We know from Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. He still rules. Now I look around and, and it doesn't look like he does. It doesn't feel like he does. It feels totally out of control. And yet God is still in his throne. Psalm 47, 2, for the Lord, the most high is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He has never stopped ruling and reigning. You want to know what's changed is the ability of his proxies to rule and reign righteously. See, when Adam and Eve were made, they were made righteous. They were made without sin. But when they chose to sin and they had the freedom to sin and they did so, they basically lost the ability to bear his image righteously and to serve as kings righteously. And again, we'll see that next week as we look through chapter 3 through chapter 11 of Genesis and see the fallout of what happened because of their sin, where they lost the ability to serve as his proxies, his vice regents, and to rule righteously and to have dominion righteously over all that he had created. But the sad thing is we all still want to be king. We all still want to have that authority that God had originally given, but we don't know how to wield that authority well. And so we always end up wielding it to do harm. We do it selfishly. We do it to get more for us and in doing so, we harm all those around us, even those we say we love. And that's the story of the Bible. We see in Psalm 47, 7, For God is the King of all the earth. 
God reigns over the nations. God sits in His holy throne. He still sits in His throne. This isn't a problem of God being out of control. It's a problem of us being out of control, mankind being out of control, that we have determined that we want to be king, that we want to rule our own lives, that we want to decide what's best for us. And that's really the story of the fall. It's a story of what happened when Adam and Eve decided that they wanted to be king instead of God. So again, this idea of the kingdom is huge. It's essential. As we saw last week, it's, it's a holy obligation for us to understand the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching it. Jesus came bringing it. And if we don't understand it, we'll never fully understand the gospel. See, in Psalm 145, 13, it says, Your kingdom, God's kingdom, is an everlasting kingdom. It didn't stop in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall. His dominion endures throughout all generations. See, God is still in control. God is still sovereign. God is still the king of all the nations. He's, he was king over Nebuchadnezzar. He's king over every ruler, potentate, dictator, person who rules on this earth at this moment, including the president of the United States. God is in control. But we live in a time where people are in rebellion against the king. Blatant, open rebellion against the king. As a matter of fact, they don't even want to acknowledge him as king. They don't even want to acknowledge him as existing at all. There is no God is what most of the people on the, this earth believe. So what we have to wrestle with is, well, we know He's God, we know He's King, we know He's sovereign, but we, do we treat Him as such? Do we recognize His kingdom? So when we talk about the kingdom, one of the things we're going to have to wrestle with is that we tend to think of territory. That word conjures up in our mind a place. That's why when we hear the kingdom of heaven, we think of heaven. We think of a place we go to when we die. We think of the kingdom of Denmark. We, we think of the United Kingdom. We think of a place where a king sits somewhere on a throne in a palace and rules. But that's not how the scriptures typically use this word. In the Bible, it has a very different meaning, and it's, it's very important that we understand this. In the Hebrew, it's, it's the Hebrew word malkuth, and, and it, it isn't really talking about a place. In the Greek, it's basileia. And in, in neither case, in Hebrew or Greek, is it talking about a place. It can refer to a place, but typically in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it's always talking about something else. It's talking about power. Kingdom equals power. It, it refers to a reign. It refers to kingly rule, not a place. And that's really hard for us to get our heads around that it's about the authority or sovereignty that's exercised by a king, and it really doesn't matter if there's a place or not. Remember, it says that God sits on His throne. His throne is in heaven, is how the Scriptures describe it, and yet He rules over all the earth. He's not relegated to heaven. God's not up in heaven ruling over that domain, and everything else is off limits to Him. No, He rules over everything that He has made. This isn't about a place. This is about right to rule, authority, power. He's not relegated to a place. He's not relegated to a certain region. And, and again, when, when we did the book of Jonah, what was interesting is that in the Middle Eastern mind and in the pagan mind especially, they thought of their gods as being regionalistic gods. They believed that their gods only ruled over certain areas of territory. And so the God of the Israelites ruled in Israel, and their God ruled another region. And so they limited their gods to terri territorial domains. But that's not how this works, especially with God. God is not limited. God has authority. God has power over anything and everything, everything because He's the Creator God. He made it all. He has kingly rule, and it's not relegated to a place. So the kingdom of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, refers to the kingly rule of God. So when Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom is here, He's talking about the rule of God is here. How? In the form of the Son of God, the King. He's bringing it to bear here. 
Why? Because God rules everywhere. And Jesus, by showing up on earth, was bringing that right to rule to bear in this place. But see, not just in this place, in men's hearts, in men's lives, on earth as it is in heaven. So it's referring to the authority to rule, the right to rule, the sovereignty to be king. And that's why what Jesus had to say was so important. It's less about a realm than it is about the right to reign. Jesus, because he was the son of God, the Messiah of Israel, had the right to rule. Remember, Genesis 1 tells us that he was there at creation. He not only took part in creation, but it was all made for him and by him. And he has the right to rule over it. So when Adam and Eve failed to rule righteously and use their power the way they were supposed to, Jesus came to fix that. Jesus came as a man, the second Adam, in order to do what Adam didn't do at the beginning. When the word Malkuth refers to God's kingdom, it always refers to his reign, his rule, his sovereignty, and not to the realm in which it is exercised. That's huge. That's so important for us to understand. His kingdom is not just a place. It's not heaven where we go when we die. God is not stuck someplace ruling over this ethereal land that we can't see, but maybe one day we will. No, he still rules over all. He's the king of all creation. And that includes this planet. And that includes my life and your life. God's rule has never diminished, waned, or departed in any way. See, His kingdom is His power. That's why Jesus says, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. Thy power be made manifest on this earth just like it is in heaven. And guess what? It already is because He's God, but He wants to manifest it through us, through our lives. See, this is about universal authority. Universal authority over all things. And God wants to do it through you and me. See, what's important for us to understand is that God was king long before he created anything. He didn't need the earth. He didn't need the heavens. He didn't need the sun, the moon, the stars. He didn't need man. He didn't need anything. He was already king over all even before he made it because he's sovereign. But he made it and then he put man in charge of it. And then man blew it, just blew it up. They blew the opportunity. They blew the chance because they decided, no, I want to be king. I want to rule. God was saying, no, the earth is evidence of my kingly power and I'm going to give you dominion over it, but you serve on my behalf and you serve at my pleasure. But again, it didn't take long for Adam and Eve to do something to screw that whole thing up. God was sovereignly, he spoke it all into existence. Even creating them and then giving them authority over it. And then they decided they wanted a different kind of authority. They didn't want borrowed authority. They wanted their own brand of authority. Remember Satan said, eat of the fruit of the tree and you will be as God. You will be like God knowing good from evil. You will be autonomous. You will will be self-determining. You will get to decide what's best for you, what's right, what's wrong. You don't need to listen to some God. You will be like God. And that's what set the whole thing down the downward path that it took in Genesis chapter 3. So the kingdom of God is these things. It's, it's his kingship, his, his rule, it's his authority. It's his reign and not just a realm or even a people. And we've got to get that through our heads that it's all about God ruling and reigning as he is right and just to do. It's about his rule, his authority, his sovereignty. That's why when Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he's not talking about a place. Think about that. When Jesus said this, he's he's not saying seek first heaven, seek first a kingdom somewhere, go find this place and figure out how to get there. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, seek first the power of God. We're to seek the righteous rule and the reign of God over our lives. And you may think, well, gosh, I already do that. But I'm going to push back on that. Because if you're anything like me, and I think you are, you don't live your life that way. You truly don't live your life seeking the righteous rule and reign of God over your life. You spend more time seeking your righteous rule 
over your life, just like Adam and Eve did. I want to decide what's best for me. I want to buy this house, this car. I want to live in this neighborhood. I want to have these friends. I want to watch this or, or read this or do this. I want to decide what's best for me. And when you do that, even as a Christian, you are basically saying, no, I'm seeking first my kingdom, not his. I want to rule and to reign in place of God. And we all do it every day of our lives. And that's why Jesus is calling us back to something different, that we would pray, your kingdom come, God. I want your rule to come in my life, in my sphere of influence. I want to be your vice regent, and I want to rule and reign on your behalf over the things that you've given me, and to do it righteously and justly. Your kingdom come, your will be done. See, this prayer, according to Eldon Ladd, is a petition for God to reign, to manifest His kingly sovereignty and power, to put to flight every enemy of righteousness and of His divine rule, that God may be king over all the world. That is what you should long for. That is what I should long for. But it begins in my life and in your life. Do you really want God to rule and reign in your life, over all in your life? Are you willing to give it to Him and let Him have it? See, that's been the problem from day one. Ever since the fall man has wanted to rule. Ever since the fall, man has been rejecting God as king and placing themselves on the throne. And we see it even in the people of Israel. Very early on when God chose the people of Israel, this is what happens. They come to Samuel the prophet and they, they tell him, you're old, your sons do not walk in your ways. Appoint a king to judge us like all the other nations. We want a king. And it says, when they said that, give us a king to judge us, their demand was displeasing in the sight of Samuel, the prophet. He didn't like this because he knew that God was to be their king. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. This was the people of God, the chosen people of God, set apart by God, the descendants of Abraham, and he had chosen them, blessed them, given them his law, given them a tabernacle. And yet they were deciding we don't want God to be our king. We want a human king. We, don't, we want a king like all the other nations. And so I've created this little chart to help us to understand what's going on here. Because in the beginning, God made Adam and Eve and they were to rule. They were to be his vice regents and to rule righteously. And in the end... God sends Jesus and he reigns, but he does so righteously. He does what Adam and Eve didn't do. Adam and Eve decided they wanted to be king. Jesus came and he was king. He came as king. He lived as king. He died as a king. He remains the king, but he did everything in obedience to his father who had delegated authority to him. And in between's the mess. In between Adam and Eve... And in, in between the coming of Christ, we have this battle between the reign of God and the reign of man. This is the time in which we live. This is the time in which we see mankind struggling with, I want to be God. I want to rule and reign. And yet God has placed you and I in the midst of this as citizens of his kingdom. And we have the ability to live as citizens of the kingdom as we allow God to rule and reign in our lives and as we have dominion over the things He's placed under us. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. It says, For His invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made by Him. So He's revealed Himself in creation. So they are without excuse. They being those who see God in creation, He's revealed Himself. For although they knew God, they can see God. They understand that there's something greater than themselves. They didn't honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Do you see what's happening here? Paul is, is describing what happened as a result of the fall. 
Adam and Eve were made to have dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and over everything that was made. But instead, they wanted to be king. But instead of truly being king, they worshiped the things that God had created. They didn't have dominion over them. They bowed down to them. And they let creation rule over them. And that's the world in which we live. And that's the day in which we live. And we see it all around us, guys. You turn on the news, you, you, you flip through your social media feeds and you see it all around us. This idea that mankind is worshiping creation rather than having dominion over it. We're worshiping creatures rather than having dominion over them. We're worshiping other men rather than living as the, the righteous rulers that we were meant to be. But you and I can still play that part, even in a fallen world, because we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And we can allow God to rule and reign righteously through our lives and make an impact on all those around us. So here's your questions for this week. Why does humanity have such a difficult time accepting God as king? And do we exhibit the same tendency? As believers, do we struggle with letting God be king? And if so, how does that show up in your life? Secondly, discuss the following quote and the implications it has for us. We must think of Adam as a kind of living, sacred projection of Yahweh. Adam was to walk across the earth and be the image of God, bear the image of God everywhere he went. And guess what? That's true of you and me as believers in Jesus Christ. What are the implications? Finally, in what ways can we seek first the kingdom of God? What would that look like today for you, for me? As we go about our day, how could we seek first the power, the rule, and the reign of God in our day. Father, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for these men, for their faithfulness to, to watch these videos. And I pray that you would use them to transform their lives, that you would draw us closer to what it means to be citizens of the kingdom and understand all that that means, the power that's been given to us, the responsibility that's been delegated to us, Father, that we are your emissaries. We are your ambassadors. We have been given your power and the right to rule and reign on this earth on your behalf. Would you help us to do it wisely, righteously, lovingly, submissively, humbly, all for your glory and not our own. And I pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We'll see you guys next week.